God, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, confession of sins, that kind of stuff. And um, I'll do, we'll wait 30 seconds and then I'll uh, start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to set everything aside for the time being to be with you, your spirit, your truth of your word. Help us to compare these scriptures uh, with other scriptures, um, to rightly interpret them, <clears throat> and we will know the way of path that uh, Paul has given us to spiritual maturity with the Philippians. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, i find the little note I have back here. There we go. Um, we're on Philippians chapter 4. And um, there's a little outline here. And <clears throat> if, you've, if you've had a chance to read in advance, uh, you can kind of see where we're going. And... Uh, that uh, Paul is continuing the charge towards spiritual maturity and teaching uh, both by example and by doctrine uh, for the Philippians. <clears throat> and so this is kind of the outline of, of what everything looks like. And the first one is spiritual maturity. And uh, what I like about this piece here is, is it brings the casualties in immediately. The casualties of what? Of the advance of spiritual maturity. Um, these are actually people who are in no man's land. And how do we know that they're in no man's land? Because we've actually showed it that passing the test in no man's land is the way in which you go towards spiritual maturity. Everybody, everybody has done it. Uh, anybody who goes towards spiritual maturity uh, goes that way. There's not a second way. There's not an easy path. Um, and that will be covered in verses 1 through 7. And uh, remember this. This is, this is our... Uh, this is our call here from James, kind of pure joy, <laughs> okay? And what there will be is there will be testing and there will be pressure uh, given as part of the Christian maturity. So if, um, if you have zero pressure and you have no antagonism from others, then in reality you um, may want to question your path, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> because that's what it's saying here. Uh, number two is in verses 8 through 13 of this chapter 4. And it's the advance to Christ's likeness. This is, this is from chapter 3, uh, verse 8, if you remember. This is it. Christ's likeness is maximum experiential sanctification. We covered that um, a little while ago when we were talking about what, what is spiritual maturity. It is the sanctification experience uh, of, of through, through experience. Experiential sanctification is this technical name. And that is as you go through life. The experiences you have are the testing in them, and they raise you when you pass them, and they lower you when you fail them. It means you have to go back to the drawing board and redo the uh, doctrines. <clears throat> What's really cool about this chapter is it actually goes back into some of the stuff that's already been taught in chapters 2, uh, specifically in chapter 3 as we see here, um, to remind us of what he already taught them so that they can go back into that reading into, and, and, and move forward. Um, it's, it's like a textbook. The Bible is like a textbook. And when you're taught the things, in reality you're supposed to mark up your textbook so that when you have an issue, you have a reference for it. Okay, You know what to do. And we'll see that in here. The uh, verses 14 through 19 will be uh, the plan of God's logistical support. Now, logistical is another word for supplies, okay? So whenever you have logistical support, it's what God supplies you to be enabled to grow and mature. In reality, is that He supplies everything. And we know from God's plan, see, so that's God's plan, logistical support. What do we know God's plan is? God's plan is a plan of grace, which means that you don't have to earn it, you don't have to pile it up, God will supply it, as you, as you need it, as you advance. 
And this is the logistic report for number two above, which is the advance to Christ likeness. Okay? And that'll be in these verses. And all, all this to remember our goal. Our goal is maximum glorification of God and Jesus Christ. And this will be in, in verses 20 through 23. <clears throat> um, that glorification comes in this manner. Is that when God can put his people in the devil's world, and this is the devil's world, when he can do that and have them succeed in spiritual uh, power and in likeness of Christ, that is not only logistical grace, uh, grace, but that is glorification of God in the devil's world, which is what we are. Okay, that's what we are. So that kind of outlines where we're going, and um, we'll start with the verse, verse one. <coughs> Let me read it in the in the NIV, and then I'll, I'll read a different translation. Um, and I call this casting the vision. Okay, that's not right to, because vision has such a, a strange uh, analogy in Scripture. There are no more visions in the New Testament, right? Mm-hmm. Or at least in the church age, there is some in, in the Gospels, but none in the, uh, uh, but none in the uh, the uh, Christian uh, epistles. That's what they call the studies. So it says, therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of confusing. <laughs> uh, therefore, my brothers, in another translation, um, therefore, my brothers, beloved and desired, okay, my source of happiness, uh, my reef or my crown. Um, so stand firm, and we'll get into the what up here. Stand firm in what? Stand firm in the Lord. Um, the loved ones, okay? So, with this way it has in it, especially with the word therefore, and let me just kind of read it. The therefore is, is, the, is a piece which says, given what verses we just covered, this is the therefore. Therefore means go, because of what happened before, therefore do this, okay? So that's the verses from, that we just got out of, uh, verse 20 and 21. And let's just read them so that we know what he's telling us to therefore to move forward to, okay? So he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a savior uh, from there, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body, Christ-like body. Let's talk physically. Um, and if you're in Tuesday's study, or you haven't had a chance to do it, that's what it's talking about. So it's spring pointing and more or less saying that based on that, therefore, brothers, beloved ones, and this is really a piece here. Brothers is the word Adelphos. We're familiar with that from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Um, and brothers just means... Uh, family of God. It's uh, it's an anthropopathic. It's it's really collectively like we like like we have always used uh, the word brothers or man. Mankind does not mean just man. It means man and woman. Same way this is. This is family of God. And beloved here is the is the beloved of of God. And in this case, the the subject of this is Paul calling the brothers, which so you know they're saved, and he's calling them beloved. Uh, the word beloved is used when uh, God the Father is talking about the Son, when God the Son is talking about the Father, when Jesus is talking about us, and when Paul is talking about them, and hopefully when you are talking about others. Okay? And this is not a beloved, a personal love, although in this case it has become personal in the fact that, the, the, and we'll see that later on, and the joy that has been brought to Paul from leading these positive volition believers to advancing, he has come to love them. Okay? Um, and let me help you out with that. Is that, in reality, the ones that are beloved by a teacher or a pastor or by other believers are those who are kindred in their faith and in their doctrine. In reality, there is no beloving of those who are, the word we used last week uh, on Tuesday and the other times, 
comes from theme, and it's a word called reversionist. There is no beloved to the reversionist from a teacher or an apostle's point of view. They are the enemies of the cross, as we talked about in verses 18 and 19 from the last chapter. Um, so it's not that you don't have a, an agape love for them, an impersonal love, uh, what you don't have is this love here is a, is a personal love. This is a beloved, beloved one. So the, the piece, there's many, many verses on this. They're easy to look up. I'll give you just a couple of them. Uh, Romans 12, 19. Uh, Hebrews 6, 9. 1 Peter 2, 11. Uh, 4, 12. 2 Peter 3, 1. They kind of go on and on. So all you have to really do is look up the word beloved in your concordance and you'll see all the, the applications for that. And that is the word from uh, agapetes, which is from uh, agape. It's the adjective form of the noun agape. Um, what we have next is this piece where he says, I desire. Um, the desire here is one of... Um, that he has a desire. Paul does. I'm trying to find the word here. Here it is. This is Paul's desire to be with the Philippians. Um, and one of the reasons being is that um, this, is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting doctrine that happens from this, but when, as you mature, um, this, is, this is counterintuitive and it's actually not what you hear. But I want you to think about it. As you mature, in, in, um, in Christianity, as you have more faith, your love gets uh, more truthful. But what happens is that you don't actually get more friends, you actually get less. Okay? Um, and one of the reasons being is that as you mature, you shed people from your life that are negative. Okay, and, and much of that is biblical, but the other part is that you surround yourself with people of like desire. Okay, and what I mean by that is that you surround them by people who have the same desires that you do, which is to put Christ first, um, which is to put Bible doctrine first, which is people who will always orient themselves to doctrine first. So even though you will diplomatically and in personal love, be very gracious to those people who I would say in your second or third tier of friendships, but the people you will gather to your closest friendships and you will have the greatest uh, brotherly love for and desire to be around and to long for, one of the words here is to long for, is the same ones that he's talking about, Paul's talking about with respect to the Philippians. That these are the people that he desires to see. That these are the people he desires to be with. You don't see him use this. This is very intimate um, in that you're seeing inside of Paul's heart where his heart is such that he has, he's a very mature believer, probably the most mature believer on the face of the earth when he writes this. But note that his greatest desire to see people and be with people is those who are of kindred spirit, have the same goals, have the same direction, okay? And if, if you're honest with yourself and you look at your, the people that you surround yourself, they are the people who have that same goal. They're the people who are going to the point of spiritual maturity. And it doesn't mean you won't have other friends. It means that those other friends will fall back from the ones who come forward. <clears throat> okay? Um, and then that, but he says, they are his joy. This is an interesting thing here because this joy is the same word as the fruit of the Spirit. It actually does mean the happiness of God. And what it means is that, is that as you build a rapport <clears throat> with other mature believers, you build up a joy of God, a happiness of God, resulting from that, because you share the same spirit, you share the same doctrine, you, say, you share the same direction. Okay, And we're going to talk about all that down here too. Um, the other part is the, is the crown part. Now this is Stephanos, Technically, it does not mean the word crown, although every piece in the scripture, it's translated crown. Uh, crown would be diadem, okay? We're all familiar with diadem. Well, maybe some of us aren't, but the word diadem means crown. Uh, Stephanos actually means reef, okay? Uh, but, it's, but when Paul uses it here, 
he is referring to the athletic games of the Roman times uh, and of the Greek times, which everybody who is listening to this is completely familiar with, okay? Because spiritual maturity, and, we, and we've talked about this analogy after analogy, running the race, fighting, boxing, we've, we've talked about those, to win a crown. It was Stephanos. Um, and the reason this is important is a diadem you inherit. That means you didn't do anything to get it. You got it from somebody else, okay? Like your father or your... If, if, if your father is the king, then you are a princess by divine, okay? Did you do anything to it? No. Okay, you didn't. It, it's, from, it's from the fact that you're, uh, you're, her, you're heredity. But Stephanos means a very specific word. And most of the ones in the scriptures are like this. Even the ones talking about angels that we read about in Revelation, they use Stephanos because it is a earned crown. Okay? It is something that you earn. Okay? Your parents didn't give it to you. You earned it. Okay? You earned it, not because you're strong, powerful, and smart, but because God has grace, and He's strong, powerful, and smart, and you followed His way. That's what you did. You followed the recipe, which is called the plan of God. Okay? But you earn that. This is the part that says that, that Paul looks at them and says, you're my crown. Okay? He looks at the Philippians and tells them that he desires to be with them, that they are his joy, the joy of God, because of their response, and because he is on God's team, and they're on God's team. Now, I'm not talking about positionally. I'm talking about experientially. They are in the same advance to Christ's likeness. That's what they want. Paul's told them about it. They want it. Okay? And what happens is because they desire that and they want to go in the same way he does, in reality, <clears throat> that joy, the joy of God, is shared with them by God because of their desire to advance the Christ likeness. And they will achieve a crown, okay? Just like Paul achieved the crown, and, and we'll get that at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. And this is the same thing that we will get it. So it's Paul here, but the, but the definition of it says that this, this course of advancing the Christ likeness and rewards is set up by God for every human being to have. Now, the first step that the human being takes is that by faith in Christ, they now get into the plan of God. If, if they are not believers and they do not have faith in Christ, in reality, they are in the plan of the devil. Okay? But it's optional. They can choose in. Uh, although once you choose in, you can't choose out. <laughs> but you can choose to be in this plan. And so, this is the part that Paul's going here. Is that Paul, they are, his, they are his crown, okay? He also will run into some other ones here. And other believers who are in a different position, they have a different spiritual gift, if they go to advancing Christ's likeness, like in Philippians is leading them to, as in this whole chapter, and in, in 2 Timothy, it shows some of the advancement, and other scriptures, other mature believers will also receive their crown because of their advancing to Christ's likeness in the plan of God. Okay? That's how it goes. That's the simple explanation of it. Okay, so I'm, we're going to go through a couple of these so we can kind of touch bases. And we're not really going to go into the, um, the crowns uh, specifically because about two months ago, I spent an entire class on it, so if you want to find out what that is, um, you, can, uh, you can go to that. Now we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, 9 first, and one of the reasons we're going to go to that is um, because he also says the same thing about the Thessalonians. And why does he say that? Okay, for an apostle or for a pastor, his congregation has the potential to be his crown. What does that mean? Is that if he advances them in spirituality by providing them the Word of God and they take it up positively and they advance, as they advance, he gets a reward for having done that. Okay? And that's what he's talking about here. So, let's see, 2.19 and 20. He says, um, he says, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown, in which we will glory. See, this is the exact same wording. Exact same wording. Identical wording here. Okay? And he talks about the crown. That word is Stephanos again. 
He says, in which we glory. This is where um, he will be glorified. In reality, he will share the glory of Christ. Anybody who gets the crown of righteousness, the crown of joy, the crown of life, who gets those, and we've talked about them, we're not going to repeat that, but those who, 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 who receive those as a response to following God's advance to Christ-likeness, which is written in the scriptures that we've been talking about for months, those who do that will glorify Christ, as we will talk about later down here, um, but they will share in that glory by having that crown on their resurrection body forever and ever and ever, okay? Uh, they will become, in reality, the aristocracy, and that's the royal side, okay? That's the royal of the royal, in reality. Um, and, and we know that from, from Scripture because even in the parallel to human beings, when the victory is won by an individual, they become knighted. We have that in, in all of human history, okay? By that advancement of victory, you share in the royalty of the king. That's how it goes. So he's using these, and as is God, to help us understand something that, in reality, in its, perf in its, perf in its perfection, would not be understood by us. Okay, and I mean by this, it's an anthropopathism, it's a language of accommodation, it's because the rewards that we will have are indescribable in time. Okay, God does, God does the, as best as can be done to help us understand this by using parallels in human experience to help us understand something that is divine in its quality and its standard. So it's beyond our ability, but yet we can still understand it without understanding it completely. And he says, um, in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. Okay? Note, that is the rapture. And note, the rapture is followed by the, white, by the, uh, uh, by the Bema seat, by the judgment seat of Christ. And which is what he's talking about. That's when you will be awarded those things, okay? Um, and then he says... Um, he says, is it, uh, it, is it not you, indeed, you are our glory and joy. See, he's talking about, this time he's talking to the Thessalonians. In reality, the Thessalonians, when they advance in spiritual maturity, will be a contribution to uh, Paul's crown and glory. In this exact same, almost a parallel to this thing, okay? Um, the next one is we're going to go to um, 2 Timothy um, 4, 8 and 9. And this is the, this, the reason I go to this one is this is the best parallel of where we're at. Okay. It's kind of nice about doing it this way. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to keep sending them on papers because I think people do more work <laughs> and actually think about what I'm, what I'm, I'm writing here. Um, let's see, 2 Timothy 4, 8 and 9. Oh, there it is, okay. <clears throat> now there is in store for me. Now, what the context of what Paul's telling, this is like two months before he's going to be executed, okay? This is his last letter. It's within two months, maybe 30 days of the time he writes this letter, Paul is executed. He's beheaded, okay? Uh, he's, not put on a, he's not put on a cross because in reality he's a citizen, and citizens are never put on the cross, no matter what they've done. They have the right to be either to bleed to death by you know, cutting their veins in, in, a, in warm water, or they have the right to, have, to be decapitated, which is the least painful death, especially compared to the cross. He says, uh, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, meaning that Jesus is the judge, he will be the perfect judge, um, he will not be fooled like many people in church are by the behavior that we see in church. Okay? He's not fooled by that. He sees through all that he is omniscient. Okay? Um, so a lot of the hypocrisy that is present in churches um, will get nothing. In fact, they'll actually be, uh, they'll actually be, they'll be judged as evil before the entire world. Okay? That's not sin. That's evil. Okay? Because evil is not judged on the cross. How do we know that? You don't have to confess it, right? That sounds strange, but it's true. Unless it leads to sin, you don't confess it. 
um, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Okay, what day is that? That's the, that's the judgment seat of Christ, okay? It's the day of the rapture. The day of the rapture, that's not a day. <laughs> uh, and then what, mark this piece right here. This shows the inclusion of this principle for us, okay? What I wrote here about the Philippians and what I wrote here about us is included in the next piece. He says, not only to me, but also all those who have longed for his appearing, okay? Long, see that word? Desire, okay? That's the desire for Christ. Um, and I thought so, and he says, do your best uh, to come to me quickly. He's talking to Timothy here. But I want to, I want to back just to one more verse here just for fun, verse 10. He says, for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And then he talks to him about the next guy. But Demas is one of the guys, if you remember earlier, I think it's in 1 Timothy, he was one of the associates, the fellow workers, with Paul. Okay? So what happened to him is he loved the world. Something in his advance to maturity, when he went into no man's land, he chose against the plan of God. Okay? In fact, not only did he choose against it, he continually chose against it. Because as you know, if you choose against the plan, you just fall out of fellowship. And what do you do? You confess it, right? You go right back into fellowship and you advance. Or maybe you don't advance. It's a, it's a volitional choice. But what it's telling us here very clearly is that somebody who actually saw Paul, saw the miracles, was part of the missionary journeys, part of this great mission, in reality, bailed out. Okay? He bailed out. He bailed out on the advance. And this is the piece right here. Now, we don't know if he ever came back, but I suspect he did not. <clears throat> so it's a great verse to kind of show that, one, that we get this thing. We're in this, we're in this inclusion into the crown of righteousness, into the crown of life, into the crown of joy. We get these because we too, like Paul, are choosing to advance in Christ's likeness, as we ran into with um, chapter 3, verse uh, 8, where he was talking about it. And the last one is um, James 1, uh, 12. It's just a short piece, but it's so good. Um, and what's nice about it, what I like about James, is James was one of the first books that's written. Okay, it was written, well, my days show 45 AD, so 15 years after Christ was on the cross, this was written. This is, this is the beginning of the church, uh, James. This is James, the brother of Christ. <clears throat> but note in it, he also brings these up. He, he knows New Testament doctrine. A lot of people will criticize Paul because they think that he has things in him that have not been taught by others. We don't do that much today, but it, it, historically it's true. But what we find him doing is talking about the same thing. He says, uh, blessed is the man who perseveres under trials. Uh, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. See, this isn't, this isn't mumbo-jumbo just from, this is a parallel that's written before Paul's even saved to show us that in reality there is a crown of life. And it comes this exact same way. See? It comes the exact same way. It follows the same path. That's what he talks about. Testing and pressure. Okay? Um, the crown of life that God <coughs> has promised to those who love him. And this love is a love, as we've talked about it, we mentioned it before as a category one love, it is the one that the scriptures talk about is our first love, okay? It is our first love. When you put the Lord first in every aspect of your life, in reality, um, you, he is number one for you, and because he's number one, you advance to be like him, okay? And there's a protocol for that advance. You don't just get to be sweet and nice like everybody tells you. Sweet and nice is a human standard. It is not a God standard. It is, and from God's point of view, it is not a goal. It is a result. Okay? Now the next piece, I want to do, next piece of this verse down here <coughs> is this piece here which says, In this way, stand fast in the Lord. That's what it says here. Um, and what, what does this way mean? What are we supposed to stand fast in? We're supposed to stand fast in this way. What is this way? This way is Bible doctrine. It's the same thing that we've covered through all of this. It has never changed. The protocol does not change, okay, um, ever. 
It always stays the same. God has the same way. He's taught this for thousands of years. It always has the same direction. <clears throat> okay? So it's Bible doctrine. It is in reality aligning in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and based on the cross. Okay? It is Bible doctrine that we hold, that we hold ourselves and our thoughts accountable to. Our actions accountable to. Our words accountable to. Our values our priorities are all held in with Bible doctrine, all within the mind of Christ, okay? All within the mind of Christ. It is God's words that we align us ourselves to. In reality, we, you don't see this much anymore. You actually don't see this where people are saying, everything I do and say and am needs to confine itself within the doctrines of the Scriptures, Okay, um, we saw. And I'll just kind of have a little bit of fun here. <clears throat> we saw in the recent elections that the values and the priorities of millions of Christians were not in line with the Word of God. They were counter to it. What does that make them? Evil. Evil. That's right. Evil is their doctrine, and it's a human doctrine. It's evil. <clears throat> in reality. They are, what did we talk about five verses ago? They are the enemies of Christ. They're the enemies of the cross. Okay? Um, do they mean to be? Nope, they don't mean to be. They have just chosen wrongly. They have chosen wrong. Okay? They had the Word of God open to them. This, the Word of God is open to everybody. Okay? It's open to us even when we do bonehead things as a Christian and we fail and we fall away. In reality, the scriptures say that God's protocol is grace. And all we have to do is confess our sins and we are righteous before God. That's what the verse says, 1 John 1, 9. And then we advance to maturity again into this, this goal here. This, remember, this is the goal that Paul puts in, in the last chapter, to be Christ-like, to be like Christ, which is the maximum experiential sanctification possible in the Christian life. Okay? Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so we're going to go to verse 2. Okay. I don't know if you can did see you, all this. We'll did see. you do James 1.12? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Somebody was sleeping in the classroom. Oh, shh, don't say anything. <laughs> I know. <it's> just <laughs> Verse 2. Okay. you got to have fun when you can, right? <laughs> fun is the basis of love. Um, what we have here in verse 2, and uh, you know, I'm going to read it to you, but I want to I emphasize what it's looking at, because sometimes you can't see it. He says, I plead with Yodia, and I plead with Senteki, uh, to be the same mind in the Lord. Okay? Now, what we're seeing here, right here, is that we are looking into the minds of these two women. And they're two women. Okay? Um, we, we know that they're two women by their, by their very names. <clears throat> and their names mean something. And I was going to go through this joke about Yoda means um, prosperous and journey and smart and proper. And, and remember this joke because I'm going to use it in the next verse. Okay? And... Um, What's her name? Um, Senteki uh, means uh, vivacious, flirty, bubbly. She's a... Oh, yeah. she, you, know, you, run into, you run into both of these at church, okay? You run into them everywhere, I suppose. But the context here is the church of Philippi, okay? <clears throat> and, but what happens is that where it says here, it says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Senteki. Now, th there's a quarrel going on between the two of them, okay? Between these two women and the church, and uh, the word here, I plead, I plead, is actually written twice for each one of them individually. Now, normally in a, in a, in a sentence, you would parallel them with an and. So you'd say, I plead with Yodia and Senteki. Okay? You would, you would parallel with an and. But, but, but Paul does not do that. He puts them separately. He says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Senteki. Okay? He pleads with them both. This is an urgent appeal to them. Okay? Um, and we're going to read these verses in a minute, but I want to talk about them first. So the two women here, okay, uh, Yodia and Senteki, um, that's a 
sounds more like an A when, when the E is a long one. <coughs> so yeah, that's how it goes that way. Um, but they're in the Philippian church. They are believers. And according to the next verse, I shall fall down here and embarrass myself, um, they fought by Paul's side. Okay? That means that they fought against two. The devil. That's right. Um, in reality, the angelic conflict is one that Christians, when they live the holy life, the Christ life, are the direct um, enemy of Satan. Now, in reality, most Christians are not the enemy of Satan in the fact that if he neutralizes them, they are out of the, bar, they're out of the, out of the game. Okay? Um, they don't have to be permanently neutralized, but many of them are neutralized for time. And that time is a time when they are not advancing to Christ like that. They are not a threat. One of the ways that you will, we talked about it in last Tuesday's class, one of the ways you will find out that you are maturing is a result of that. You will be persecuted, not by unbelievers, but by believers. Okay? And you will be persecuted by them the same as Christ was persecuted by the Sanhedrin, by the Jews. Uh, of, of his own uh, uh, his own religion, Judaism. Okay, they were his greatest enemies. They were the ones who put him on the cross. Okay, who were the ones who persecuted Paul? Okay, they weren't unbelievers. They were believers. What happened is the unbelievers executed the actions, just like Pilate and Nero did. But in reality, it was believers who were the ones that were persecuting them. Okay, so uh, this helps us understand what's going on here. The, um, these believers here, they are not just regular believers. They, in reality, are maturing believers. Okay? And they fought by his side. He makes that appeal. He says, these are not just women who are, who are just little, um, they're not just little cranky little girls who are having a little tizzy fit. In reality, these are women who are in Philippi, uh, in the, in Philippi church, and they were advancing. And what they did is they ran into no man's land. That's what's here, Okay? So they were in that piece of no man's land where they were maturing. They're part of the church, and what they did is they did that. Okay, so they're right here. They got stuck. What do they get stuck in? A quarrel. They got stuck in a quarrel. We don't know what the basis of the quarrel is, but we know what the solution is, right? We know what the solution is. So what he says to them is be of the same mind. Okay? Um, this is, this, is a, this is a verse that actually goes back to the stuff that we, um, we learned before. So, what is that same mind? Be of the same mind. That's what he says here. What is the same mind? Divine viewpoint. What is divine viewpoint? It's the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ and divine viewpoint? Bible doctrine. We talk about this all, all the time. What he is telling them, what, he is telling, what is he saying here? He says, in your mind, Sintiki and in your idea, you are having a battle. You are in a quarrel. And what happens is you have lost your fellowship. <laughs> How do you know you lost your fellowship? When you have a quarrel that you are invested in. And they are. How do we know that? Because it's still here when, they, when he writes it. They're still stuck. He heard about this and he's talking to them in a letter. Okay? And he's telling them, they're stuck. They're down here. They're out of fellowship. Okay? Now, that doesn't always happen. Many times when you have a quarrel, if you obey this um, solution here, what is the solution? Okay? Well, I'll give you the answer, and then we'll find it in the, in the, in the scriptures here that we've already done. Because he, he, is, he is driving them back to that. He says, what is the solution? Be of the same mind. Put on divine viewpoint, Bible doctrine, mind of Christ. By means of the Lord, okay? That means that whatever we grow in the spiritual maturity, it's always, in this case, by the basis of the cross, right? That's the first base. The second part is the Word of God. And the third part is the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what it is. It always follows the same thing. Okay, so that's the, by means of the Lord in this particular case. Puts in the same spot. But notice what you need here. Bible doctrine. He's telling them that your mind here, when you're in quarrelsome, what do you have? Human viewpoint. This is identical 
Okay, just so you have a parallel verse to, to match this with. This is identical to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses like 1 through, I think it's like 8, maybe 9. This is exactly what happens to them. He says, aren't you still acting like worldly because you're in an argument? That's what he says. Okay? So here's a perfect parallel to this that he's bringing up. And what he's doing here is he's giving them the solution. He's saying, how do you do that? Become the mind of Christ. How do you become the mind of Christ? You're at a fellowship. You have the human viewpoint. What do you do? Hey, we know the solution to that, right? 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. That restores us back up the fellowship. Now we're up here. Now we have the ability to borrow the strength of God to use it rather than to live on our little puny strength. Human viewpoint and human ways of doing things is a puny power source. And what he's saying is that you have to turn around to be Christ, like Christ, have this mind of Christ. How do you have this mind of Christ? In reality, you have to have it with power so it's useful. And what you're doing is that in reality you are humbling yourself, operative word here, mm -hmm. humbling yourself, no matter what your viewpoint is here, you're humbling yourself in order to have the viewpoint of God. You're humbling yourself by confession, recognizing that you are a human viewpoint, that you have had mental attitudes, sins, you are struggling. What you do not have is the mind of Christ. Okay? So when you recognize that you're in a quarrel, you deal with it, okay? My wife went through something this very, very recently, which I'm not going to talk about because I get in trouble, but you go through this thing, and what happened is that when she recognized it was going here, she knew what to do. She understood, she said, I'm not going there. <laughs> this is a mental attitude sin. Remember uh, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19? What does it tell us about these? This is the stuff, mental attitudes, that God hates. God detests it. He detests it. So, she, no, I'm not doing that. I don't care what I have to do, but I'm not going there. Okay? Um, and, what is, and what led her to that? Bible doctrine of the mind of Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't even playing with the viewpoint. What thing saying right, wrong? No, no, no. I'm not playing. I'm not going there. I'm not going to do it. I'm going here. I'm staying on target. This is my goal. Okay? So, that's how it's done, by the way, if you want to know how it's done. But, in reality, it was a recognition of the quarrel that these two women have not recognized. Okay? And this is be that's because this is part of their struggle. Okay? This is the part that if Euodia and Sinteki don't get, they're going out, they're going off the board. Okay, they are going to go down into reversionism, into driving the Christian life backwards. Okay, that piece that we have here. And the solution to that is what we're looking at. What happens here, okay, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll, there's a protocol in verse 3, we're not going to get to it yet, but the, but the protocol is that you two are stuck. And the reason you're stuck is because you're quarreling. And because you're quarreling, that is your red flag that you are off base. You're off base, okay? Doesn't matter how you got there, you're there. Because you now possess human viewpoint, just like in this verse here. And what you need to do, what is the solution, is that you are to gain, go back to, the mind of Christ. And the policy is confession and redirection, okay? Get going. Pass that test, and that test doesn't come up again. Because you passed it. You'll know what to do next time. You're in a quarrel. You'll just dust yourself off. You won't care if you're right or wrong. You won't care how wrong the person is or how right the person is. You'll go back to the Word of God. Because that's where we're safe. In reality, from a human viewpoint, we are always stupid compared to the Word of God. Always. Okay? Human viewpoint is not a position of strength. No matter how brilliant it sounds. No matter how genius it is, it is always a position of weakness. Okay? So let's get some verses here. Let me see if i got the verses down here. Do, do, do. Right down here. <clears throat> and I'm gonna re we're going to go to them because this, in reality, is the mentality. This is the position of the soul. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. And I'm just going to read them. Uh, but what they come to is this piece right here. Humility. 
in Christ's likeness. And what it's saying here is that humility in Christ's likeness heals. Okay? That's what heals. Um, so let's go to Philippians 2. We shouldn't be very far from it. And you don't know this from the stuff we studied before. Um, and, and actually, the steps to this are actually in Philippians 2, 1 through 3, but we're not going to read that. We're just going to read 3 and 4, <clears throat> because this is the solution to this. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, listen to this, consider others better than yourselves. Now, that doesn't mean that they are better. It means to consider them better, which means that you walk out of the argument and you step towards Christ. That's what you do. The safe ground, what's with, with, with the, with the thousand psalms say, is psalm after psalm, we walk up to the rock. That's what we do. We walk up to the rock. That saves us from all things. Okay? And he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. When you walk out of this conversation, this, this quarrel, you are also not just looking after yourself, you are looking after the other person. Now, the other person may not take that, they may continue in the quarrel, but it doesn't last for long because you have to have two people to quarrel. <laughs> okay? That doesn't mean they can't keep it, it just means that you're not there. You're not participating, nor are you uh, in that sp uh, spot anymore. So, that's the, that's the solution. What is the first thing it says here? Humility. Okay? Now, that's this piece right here. Now, watch what it does, is it follows this with, in this, this is the solution page. This is the doctrine page, okay? What he's really saying is that, you know something? How you solve this is you go back to, you go back to, you, you back to having the same mind. What is that? The mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? Right back here. Let's look at Sintiki's attitude, and in these verses, we're going to look at Christ's attitude, because there, there's a parallel here. That's why, that's why Paul uses it. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now watch what it says here. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And what that means is that even though Jesus Christ is God, he did not make it an issue during his incarnation because he, it would have caused an argument. He didn't do it, okay? Even though he was perfectly right and had all the attributes of God, he is God in the flesh, but he did not make it a point. Why? Even though he had the perfect right to it. He had the right to the glory. He had the right to the respect. He had the right to all of that, but he did not make it an issue. And the reason he didn't is because he was looking out for other people who might get tripped up by that. Okay, but notice what he did. And this is this is the humility part. Okay, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself, um, and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, when you look at the humanity of Christ and him being the God-man, going to humility, taking on the sins of the world, there is no greater humility, ever. We can't even compare it to it. But that compares us, this is the Christ-likeness. Remember in, in last chapter, in verse 8, this is what Christ went to. Okay? And what it's asking us to do here, in this, in this uh, doctrinal comparison, is to compare their attitude with the attitude of Christ that they brought up two chapters before, to consider our attitude with the attitude of Christ. Is that no matter how right we are, no matter how entitled we are, in reality, we take a step back, okay? Because we consider others than ourselves. We want to be going this way, not that way. This is our goal, to please our Lord and our God, and that's why we do it. We follow the humility of Christ. We follow that same path. Even if I'm right, do I have the right to fight about it? No, I don't. I can make the case, I'm done with the case. Uh, and I'm not going to carry that one anymore, but in the reality, that's really what he's saying. There's a comparison that Eutychia and Euodia need to do with, their, with, the, with the goal that they've had all their, their Christian life going towards maturity, and with Paul saying, look, look at what Christ did. Refer back to the letter, chapter 2. 
Same, same letter, and not even a different letter. This is the way out. This is, this is how you do it. This is how you get out of this problem. You humble yourself, like Christ did, not even as much, but your mentality is Christ-like. Okay? And the, the other verse here we have here is, where is it? 1 Corinthians 2.16, and we're familiar with this verse. I, I, I'm going to read it if you want to find it here. Um, this is talking about the spiritual man, if you remember. And the spiritual man is the one who walks. And um, the spiritual man, the pneumatikos man, that's in verse 15, he works, walks from a point of view of Bible doctrine. He is the spiritual person. Okay? That's the pneumatikos, the spiritual man, called the pneumatikos in the scriptures. Okay? And it says here in verse 16 um, that, let's go to 15 first, the spiritual maid makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to judgment. That means that when he makes a judgment about the Word of God, because he made a judgment like the Word of God in, in comparison with it, he does not fall under judgment. Even if people judge him, in reality, the judge cannot judge it because it's in like thinking. It's like-minded. Okay? And this says here, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct it? And then it says, but we have the mind of Christ. Okay? What is the mind of Christ? The Word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read all that chapter if you want to figure that out. But it's the Word of God. And what that's saying is that we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to, when we run into struggles, as we will because we are human beings, we need to go to the strength and the truth of God to get our way out of it. And that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying here. Is that you need to, you need to have the same mindset, the same viewpoint as God. Okay? So, let's go to verse 3. We have a couple minutes to do, 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 do with all that. Verse 3 says, uh, Yes, and I ask you, my um, companion, is what, what scripture I have here, um, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. See, that's, that's to their credit. He's saying, you know, when we have brought the gospel to people, these women were right there with me. Okay, as part of the Philippian church, when they were doing the gospel in, in uh, many pieces of the missionary journeys. He said, along with Clement, and somebody else goes to the church, and the rest of my co-workers, meaning the other Philippian believers in there, whose names are in the book of life. Okay, <clears throat> now, the, what I want to do with this is that, um, in verse 1 it says, yes, I request, and this is the force of a command, um, and he's requesting this, uh, this name right here, Sun uh, Zuge, okay, is what that word would be. In reality, uh, you see this sometimes as putting it as, uh, uh, what is it called, yokeman. That's what that is, yokeman, or, or, or fellow yokeman. Um, and it's a mistranslation. Uh, what it is, it this, this is a man's name, okay? We might call him Gus, unless you want to try to practice that last name. Okay? That first name. That's his name. How do we know that? One, it's masculine, and two, it's in the singular. It's not talking about a group of people. It's talking about one person here. So, let's look at it. It says, I ask you, my true uh, Sunzuke, zu, <laughs> Sunzuke, um, G-E, to help these women. Now, the, the, the thing that helps you, see the part that says, my true? That actually isn't the word for true. That is actually the word for uh, legitimate. Okay? And it can also be true, true. But what he's talking about is that whatever it is about Gus, Gus is a leader in this church. Okay? Uh, it's not yoke fellow. That's one of the translations that says yoke fellow. It's not a position. How do we know that? This word does not exist anywhere else, anywhere in the scriptures. Zero, zip, zilch. Okay? It doesn't. This is a guy who is in it. Look at the context. This is a man who is a spiritually mature believer, and this is the one that he, Paul, is going to. To say, hey, Gus, I need for you to help out these two women who are having this struggle. And what, by the way, don't just get them, but bring Clement in this too. And some of the other spiritual believers around it. Why? Where's Paphroditus? Where's the pastor of the church? In Rome, right? He's in Rome and he's sick. Okay? He's Rome and he's sick. There's no pastor there. Okay? 
So, in reality, he is taking one who probably holds a position that might be a deacon or something of that sort, but he is a person that Paul knows personally, who is a spiritually mature man, to sort this out between these two women. Okay? Now, I'm going to get in trouble just for a second, but um, not with my wife, because my wife gets this doctrine, so do many other women. Um, is that why is he sending a woman? Why not another woman? Okay? The reason being is that women are responders. Okay? They're responders to their right man, to their husbands, okay? They respond to Christ. In fact, they respond to Christ better than men do, most of them. It shouldn't be that way, but that's the age we are in. The age we are in is one of great degeneracy, and one of the symptoms of that is the fact that women are greater responders to Jesus Christ than men are in our time, okay? That's a whole other debate, huh? But we're not going there. <laughs> we're just doing this way. So why do we do this? But in reality, and we know this from Scripture. We know this from the pastor. We know this from the teacher. We know this from the deacon. What are they? They're males. Okay? Not because they're special and smart. Most of the time they're not as smart as women. But what they do have is they have a gift. And the other part is they are not responders. Okay? So let me tell you what happens when women try to sort this stuff out. What happens is they, is they, they empathize. They empathize because they're responders. And what they do is they get on this side or this side. They get on one or the other. And what happens is now we have Yodia plus another and Syncate uh, uh, all by herself. Okay? So we don't solve it. You want to have somebody in there who has the mind of Christ, who has the biblical principle. In reality, you want somebody who is objective. Okay? Men aren't responders. That's why a lot of times we're accused of not being a whole bunch of things like romantic and stuff because we're, we, in reality we're best better in shooting people and things like that, you know. We, we're best better in being the bad guy, mm -hmm. okay. We do that very well and the reality is that we don't actually have all that empathy going on. Um, so, could get in trouble with that one. But that's why. So, this is the same thing that happens is that if the pastor were there, he would be the person who did that. He would be a male. He would be the authority of the church that could get between the two of them and say, okay, let's look at the scriptures. Let me tell you back to chapter 2. <laughs> okay? Let, let, let me take you through what Richard just took me through. Okay? And then they would look at it and they go, you're right. I don't know how that happened. And what happens is that because we are human beings, it, it, it draws on our pettiness. Why do we have pettiness as, as, as Christians? It's because we still are human beings. And we still have sin natures. And until we get higher up in the Christ-likeness, we don't start to get rid of some of those things. Okay? We get hypersensitive. And so what happens is you have pettiness and hypersensitivity happening in this kind of argument. And they need somebody to sit there and say, you know something, young ladies, let's go through this, or younger women, whatever they are, older women, and let's go through the scriptures, and let's see if we can figure our way out of this, okay? First of all, we have to start from the point of humility. Can you do that? 1 John 1, 9, okay? Can you consider the other better than yourselves? Yes, I can. Okay, so where do we go from here? Christ-likeness, okay? And walk right through those verses. Ah, I got it. I know what to do now. The, the quarrel is abandoned. Okay? It's not taking any further. It's abandoned. There's no right or wrong. It's abandoned. Why? Because it has become an impediment. It's become an obstacle in their spiritual maturity. And in humility, you take and you drop that rubbish, like the garbage it is, for whatever reason, and you move on to spiritual maturity. Okay? In the exact same one that Christ did. Christ stood us out there and wait a minute. You don't understand. I am God. I shouldn't be doing this. Okay? But he doesn't do that. As, 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 as the God-man, he goes to the cross. Completes it. And is victorious. We're, I'm already over. Sorry about that. But I gave you two minutes to start with, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll come back to these verses on Tuesday and finish this up, because this is a position of uh, being a mediator, where a mediator can actually help, okay? So let's end it with prayer, and then we'll come back to it on Tuesday to sort out the little pieces of this verse. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your great love for us. I thank you that you put your truth right in front of us over and over and over again, and you give us a choice to accept it or reject it. I pray that we will accept it, 
This is the advice of Paul to move into spirituality and stay in spirituality and do not let anything get in our way, no matter what it is. I pray, Lord, for um, that we will keep that in mind, that we remember that like-mindedness